Thank you, Chris. We're going to hear that melody again several times today. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Mountain Vista Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I'm Deborah Roberts. I'm your lead pastoral associate, and I had the pleasure of designing today's service. I'll be joined by Robin Bassell, our other lead PA. A special thank you to Robin who put together today's slideshow, and that was no mean feat. And she did that again uh, last week. She did that as well. So it's a lot of time and effort involved in that, and I'm really grateful to her for doing that. Our music director is Chris Tackett, who will be playing the piano and directing the choir. We are grateful to the many volunteers who make this service possible. Our AV crew back there, our greeters, and our hospitality crew, which makes it enjoyable for folks to stay after the service for refreshments and conversation on the patio. And a special thank you today to those people I strong-armed into speaking, um, Ann Tatum, John Wilcox, Jane Gessiman, and Melody Lupke. You'll hear from them in just a bit. Thank you all. While we enjoy being present here in our beautiful sanctuary, we do have congregants who join us remotely. And we like to welcome them by waving to the camera and looking at the screen to see their shining faces up there. Good morning, everyone. The liturgical theme for this month has been paradox. And I really had trouble putting into just two words, as we've done all month, the paradox that I see in what we will be talking about today. I finally came up with seekers and keepers. Today, we honor the founders of this congregation who most definitely were seekers. They sought a community of people who shared their liberal religious beliefs, and they also sought a place where they could be together. Through all the ups and downs of the last 30 plus years, they have been keepers, keepers of the spirit of this congregation and keepers of the faith in this institution. Today, we are going to illustrate this by retelling the story of MVUU through an anecdotal description of all the places we've been, physically. You will hear members of the congregation talk about these different venues. For some of you, this will be a sentimental journey. Is that how it goes? Um, for others, it will acquaint you with our history. For everyone, it is a testimony to the resilience, a key word for today's service. You'll see that in a bit. It's a testimony to the resilience of our founders, our leaders, and our members. The words for today's chalice lighting come were written by the Reverend John Burens along with Rebecca Parker. I have to mention that John Burens is a former UUA president, but it was also my parish minister back in Needham, Massachusetts. It's entitled Hope Rises, and that's what our founders must have been thinking about. Hope rises. It rises from the heart of life here and now beating with joy and with sorrow. Hope longs. It longs for good to be affirmed, for justice and love to prevail, for suffering to be alleviated, and for life to flourish in peace. Hope remembers. It remembers the dreams of those who have gone before and reaches for connection with them across the boundary of time. Hope acts. It acts to bless, to protect, and to repair. Please join in the singing of hymn number 113. The words will be on the screen, rising as you are able, and Joel will be leading us in that.
this up very often. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Okay, we're bringing something fun back today. Who remembers the wild card? Okay, okay, that's a small response. So now, before you all came this morning, I hid two of these beautiful little cards in the room somewhere. So right now, what I'm gonna ask you to do is check under your seat and see if you've got the wild card. No, it's, there's two of them. Oh, there's one there. Oh, and we got them. Okay, so now hold on to them. Don't panic. A little bit later in the service, if you are holding the wild card, you will have a chance to participate in today's service and share a quick story. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the prompt is yet because I don't want you to spend the whole time thinking about it. But a little bit later, I will return and I will give you an opportunity to get rid of the card if you don't want it after you hear the prompt. There will only be one shuffle, and then I'll come back a third time and we'll share. Got it? All right, don't panic. Good morning, I'm Ann Tatum. I'm honored to tell you about our planning history, especially since I didn't arrive at MVUU until September 1989 four months after our official Charter Sunday at Cross Middle School. I did, however, interview most people in this story extensively over the years, both formally and informally, over coffee, riding in cars, whatever. In 2009, I put this into a script for our 20-year MVUU celebration. The story begins even before we thought it would. In 1950s and 60s, Tucson was a small town atmosphere. In the 50s, Ina Road was still dirt, according to an old friend who had lived in the former Tohono Chul house, now a gallery. Have any of you driven along Golder Ranch Road up toward Catalina? A member of the Golder family donated a tract of land for a UU church in northwest Tucson sometime in those years. Times were rough in the 60s for the Unitarian Universalist Association, and they needed to sell that land for cash, and did. Fast forward to the 80s, and Tucson still growing. New studies show a burst of growth in the Northwest. Dave Johnson was the minister at the Unitarian Church of Tucson, and he talked to a loyal congregant, Howard Morton, about the expected blossoming of people in the new Sun City and Oro Valley, not to mention Marana. Although Howard had lived for years on the west side, up on Sweetwater Drive, and it, that was west, um, Dave Johnson asked Howard to spearhead a group to organize a congregation. Now, our Howard was a researcher for the U U.S. Department of Agriculture at Campbell and River, and he considered that northwest. He asked Claire Toth to help him, a longtime UUCT member and a school psychologist at TUSD. Claire ne lived near Tucson Mall, which they both considered Northwest. I mentioned these people's jobs to let you know that it was working folks who volunteered so that we can have our community now. Wondering whether the UUA could help with physical cash beyond advising, Reverend Johnson told Howard about the donated land that had been sold. So Hi Howard decided to do something about this. He took time off from work to travel to Boston, seeking consulting on starting a new congregation and asking about that money from the land. Perhaps times had changed. Claire's home became the place for meetings about the startup congregation, and later it was the earliest board meeting space. Rosemary Edmonston lived near Howard on the west side, and as a UUCT member, Rosie joined the team, often riding with Howard, especially after he found her one night on the side of the road fixing a flat tire. Emily Ricketts, a longtime UUCT member, 
and a cytotechnologist, still lives in her midtown Tucson home. And she couldn't be with us this morning here. I hope that she's able to tune in from home. She had family there. Yet she wanted to be part of building the new congregation. Emily is the only living member of the planning team and still an active congregant today. Other planning committee members from UUCT included Leon Bennett Alder, who passed just last year. Yay, Leon. Reverend Sandy Shalang passed away earlier this year. Jeff Knowles served as RE director for some time at MVUU and was a congregant and is now deceased. Reggie Riggler, I thought of her as a younger woman with a big personality. She died some years back. Reggie claimed the distinction of being the first signer of our membership book on the official Charter Sunday. She was proud of that. In working together for their common purpose, which you and I are enjoying today, this group found tight bonds. They also had many laughs. Claire had a yippy dog who delighted in finding food in people's purses during the meetings. <laughs> he gave Emily quite a bit of trouble with her french fries. The physical bonding element was a certain kind of cookie. I think it was filled cookies in different flavors. Emily and Claire told me once that Claire would hold some of them back for later, hold chocolate cookies only back, because no matter how many she put out of that kind, Howard would eat them all. <laughs> On a serious note, this group initiated our federal status as a 501c3 nonprofit organization and filed with the Arizona Corporation Commission. Reverend Marie Simons was contracted one quarter time for sermons and ministerial activity. May 17, 1989 was Charter Sunday at Cross Middle School. A footnote. Howard persisted after the Cross Middle School opening to press the UUA for compensation for the land. Meanwhile, we bought and moved into Cromwell. Success, well, partial success, finally came in the form of a $50,000 settlement to be paid over five years, $10,000 at a time. This enabled us to have a religious exploration director in the 1990s. We give thanks to the visionary people who created our beloved conversation. And now, on to the days at Cross. Hi, I'm John Wilcox. I uh, am sitting down because if I fall down, I won't be so far. <laughs> uh, but I wanna first of all, thank uh, Chuck and Ann Tatum for their help in putting this together because frankly it's a long time ago that uh, Helen, my wife and I went to Cross Intermediate School uh, as parishioners, not as students. <laughs> Helen and I became charter members of this congregation in 1989. We got here just before the Tatums. I just noticed that uh, we moved here from being members of Community Church of New York, which is a rather large church on 35th Street in the shadow of the Empire State Building. And it was a big switch to come here and meet a few people in a school, but uh, we got used to it pretty, pretty quickly. And it was, uh, it was a pretty small group with Marie Sip Simons, Simmons, Simons as a quarter time minister who was not UU, right? Yeah, he was trying to be, but he never quite made it, I think. <laughs> uh, we met in part of a gym, which was divided off by a retractable curtain over the intermediate school. And Ari met on the stage and uh, small kids were in the kitchen. So uh, we got along quite nicely. And uh, every week we built church. We did have a cabinet there. So we had stuff in the cabinet we could put out. And uh, somebody put the uh, symbols. We don't have the symbols of the various religions. Oh, they're in the oasis. Uh, 
So we put those up and it uh, seemed pretty much like a UU church. And uh, we then uh, tore it down after the services every Sunday. Closer? How's that? Ooh, it sounds awfully loud. Uh, our services were varied. We had the minister once a month, and the rest of the time were by members or ministers visiting from Phoenix or Tucson or different places around here. And uh, we had representatives from various Tucson organizations, uh, charitable organizations, the city, et cetera, uh, and professors from the university. Uh, we always used to say, if you don't like today's service, come next week. It, it's always different. So a lot of visitors went around, uh, away confused. <laughs> they, uh, they, um, that was back in the day when uh, things were uh, different all over the denomination. We were members in other congregations and there wasn't a lot of standardization in Unitarian Universalism. But over the years, that has changed a lot. And I think if you go to any church, you'll find pretty much the same elements and subject matters for the sermons. Um, in my mind, we now seem like a real, more like a real religion than we did in those early days. But don't get me wrong, there are a lot of nice things about a small congregation just starting out. Everybody knows everybody. People really pitched in and there was a lot of camaraderie and a sense of closeness, particular to a smaller group. Helen and I thoroughly enjoyed it, but then we grew, and in the next episode, you'll hear about all the things we got because we were bigger. Thank you. While the choir, while the choir is on its way up here, yes, that's your cue, come on. This piece actually has a part for the congregation in it. So could we get the next slide up? There we are. Listen, repeat back. Resilience, we are strong. Resilience, we are strong. Shoulder to shoulder, keep moving on. Shoulder to shoulder, keep moving on. Resilience, make a new plan. Resilience, make a new plan. Stand up again and say, yes, we can. Stand up again and say, yes, we can. There you go. That just repeats a whole bunch of times. Sing along with the choir. And you know, this would be so much easier if you just come to choir. It would make it so, all this so much easier.
Good morning, I'm Jim Gesserman. I was uh, chair of the Building and Grounds Committee for six years from 2011 to December 2016 when we moved out of our Cromwell buildings. The Cromwell property was located just 2.5, you can look in the picture, 2.5 miles north of here at the east end of Cromwell Drive. Our property consisted of a south, our land consisted of a south property purchased in 1991 with three buildings, a triple wide trailer unit, a ranch house known as the Goldblatt building, and a tool shed, plus a parking lot. And the north property purchased in 2005 had a two-story storage barn, an abandoned brick building, and a community garden. So this is remembering the triple wide in a series of photos here. Uh, the average monthly Sunday service attendances recorded by John Clark ranged from 61 to 123 during 2013 to 2016, with highs in the winter and lows in the summer. I do recall a few individual services, uh, one on Easter, where the attendance reached our maximum capacity of 135 people in that triple wide. Man, it was something. The Goldblatt building included a social hall called the Fireside Room with a capacity for 53 people, one small and one larger RE room with a combined capacity of 52 people, a nursery, one restroom for adults, and one for children in the nursery, and some storage space. So this series will remember the Goldblatt property. The two-story storage barn had more than 1,500 square feet of floor space. Remembering the desert vegetation and the mountain vistas, they were great. Well, <clears throat> what were the reasons we chose to leave the Cromwell property and look for a new home location? For one, the utility control boxes and main water valve for the property were only accessible by walking difficult terrain for 50 to 300 yards from the triple wide and other infrastructure items needed repair. Major renovations would be required for MVU to secure a certificate of occupancy from Pima County for our continuing use of the triple wide and the Goldblatt buildings. We also needed more space in the sanctuary, social hall, offices, and RE rooms. In closing, it's a joy, actually, to have a new <laughs> home that is significantly better in many ways than our old Cromwell Drive home.
getting nervous. Okay, so before you were seekers and you sought out your card, now the question is, will you be keepers? The prompt for the wild card today is what was the moment that you knew MVUU was your home? And if you don't have a prompt for that or a response to that prompt, what would the moment be for you? What do you need to know? Here I am, I'm home. That's the prompt. Now you have one chance and one chance only to ditch the card if you don't want it and give it to someone else. Go. Chris, you wanna, yeah. No? No shuffling? Oh, that's exciting. We've got two keepers. All right, be ready. I'm gonna come get you in a little bit. So we've heard about Claire's Kitchen, Cross Middle School, and Cromwell. Jim made a comparison between Cromwell and our Orange Grove location, our present location. But between Cromwell and Orange Grove, there were a couple of other stops. In our more than three year period of diaspora, when we did not have a home of our own, one of the buildings we inhabited was Greenfield School, which is actually just around the corner and down the street. That was tough. Our services were held in their auditorium, which was cavernous and to me spooky. The entrance to the building was very poorly lit, and there was a steep slope down to the rows of seats, so steep that some people had trouble negotiating it and needed a helping arm. Because there were so many seats compared to Cromwell, people spread out and did not sit together so that the intimacy we had enjoyed at crowded Cromwell was lost. The minister was up on a stage approximately seven feet higher than the congregation, further adding to the sense of separation. Some people who could not negotiate that steep entrance were seated on the stage. Most memorably, Jean and may she rest in peace, Barb McCormick. The stairs from the main level up to the stage were steep and treacherous, and I remember that Julie Slayton Frank fell and hurt her ankle there. We had some wonderful services at Greenfields, but I know that our attendance decreased over time. Ann Bowling was the hospitality person, and the facilities presented her and her team quite a challenge. She had the use of a little kitchen area, but there was no room for all of us to be inside that area, so we were very frequently socializing outside in the blazing sun. At some point, Anne switched to putting the refreshments on a cart, which she then wheeled close to the auditorium. We gathered just outside the doors, but nobody stayed for very long. And there was an office in a small outbuilding, which had a very feeble fan and no air conditioning. I remember spending a lot of time there on hot summer days with Reverend Ron Farris as we interviewed seven candidates for the choir director position, which resulted in hiring Kim Waigua. It was practically unbearable, and I felt sorry for the candidates who sat there sweating through their interview. Other than the Sunday service and occasional board or committee meeting, MVUU had very few activities during this time which was really sad. Even though this venue was less than ideal and our interactions were limited, we remained in community. Resilience. Our perseverance and resilience and strength got us through this difficult time. So we didn't stay there for very long. And then the next stop in our diaspora was beautiful Savior Little Lutheran Church on Thornydale which was definitely a step up. I really enjoyed going there. Even if you did have a, to overlook the larger than life Jesus on the cross at the front of the sanctuary. We had a lot of space and light in that church. 
And I loved looking at the stained glass windows to the extent that my attention sometimes wandered from the reflection, that's what we called it then, as I drank in the, as I drank in the appealing colors and tried to create a story from the images in the stained glass. Our numbers continued to shrink during that time, and there were many reasons for this, not the least of which was the fact that we had to start our practice, other terminology from that period of time, we had to start our practice at noon, after the Lutherans finished all of their activities. We couldn't get into the sanctuary much before then, and so it seemed that we were always rushing to set up for our service. We had to bring in the table that served as our altar and put all of the elements on that table. We had to um, fill the bowl with water for joys and sorrows. And I was always the one draping that big blue satin cloth over the front row for the children, for a place for the children to sit. Afterwards, our stuff got stored in a closet, uh, including the keyboard that Susan Simpson, our accompanist, used because we were not allowed to touch the baby grand that was there in the sanctuary. We did have a special room for the choir there, but we never really knew how it would be set up when we arrived. What was really positive about this location was the use of their fellowship hall for coffee hour. Anne and her team had the use of a big kitchen even if she did have to store all the supplies in her garage and carry them in each week from the trunk of her car. But people began to stay around after the service, seated at the large round tables which invited conversation. That was wonderful to see, and a big part of the reason why we chose round tables when we were buying the furniture for this location. We were able to hold some events there, but each time we used the building outside of Sundays, we had to pay an additional fee. So our activities were limited, and it still didn't feel like home. We did have a somewhat better office there, though Reverend Sam, once she started, and Erin, once she began working with us, had to share the small space, which made it difficult for both of them to do their work. I remember many meetings held at that tiny table at the back of the office where accommodating eight or more people became a gymnastic feat. In spite of all the challenges this location provided, we are very grateful to our friends at Beautiful Savior for accommodating us and for our always friendly interactions with them. During this time, we continued to look for a permanent home. Who could forget the visit to the plumbing warehouse in the Costco Plaza that we actually voted to buy, but later reneged on after major issues were discovered? We also looked at a steel building up on Thornydale and later purchased a plot of land off Cortaro and drew up plans to build there. That ultimately turned out to be too expensive, and so it was back to the drawing board until this property became available, always being resilient.
Short person. Good morning. Raise your hand if you can't hear me. Oh, raise your hand if you can hear me. Am I doing okay? Okay, thank you. Hello all. I'm Melody Lupke, and this is my perspective of the Orange Grove location known as MVUU's home sweet home. Our first visit in person happened this past August after previewing the two Unitarian churches in Tucson via Zoom. Felt like stalking, but that's another story. We started our moving plan in June of 2022, knowing that we were bringing our commitment to Unitarianism with us. I personally have history with Unitarian churches in Shaker Heights, Ohio, Cleveland Heights, Ohio, Rocky River, Ohio, St. Paul, Minnesota, and two churches in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and John reminded me of a small church that I took part in. It was called Southwest UU. Should have been a premonition, but it was in Cuyahoga County, Southwest UU, Cleveland, at any rate, that's another story too. And when Charlie and I travel, we make a point of visiting other local Unitarian haunts to see how it's done elsewhere. As you can imagine, logistics vary widely. One church had a sweeping view of neighborhood urban streets, neighborhood. Another had a typical sanctuary with pews, a center aisle, and a choir loft in the rear. Still another had the sanctuary upstairs and the social hall in the basement. And one had two central aisles with a huge choir seating area on the right. All, all provided a warm and welcoming atmosphere of the faith that brings us here, a faith that works to honor and uplift us all. And what does that look like here? It looks like a wide open doorway with a smiling presence immediately offered. It looks like a warm toned sanctuary with a minimally raised platform and a wonderful piano in the front. It looks like a social hall with bookshelves and round tables. And it looks like a covered patio with round tables and coffee on wheels. I wonder at the chicken egg dichotomy of churches, does the setting shape the church or does the church shape the setting? Most likely it is a bit of both. In our case here, we took this pre-existing structure and modified it for our purposes and programs planting the sanctuary firmly in the middle and shaping the spaces around it for programming, administration, and socializing. This tells me that we center ourselves around the core of our faith, expanding outward for community. The view of mountain vista is actually not the mountains, but our presence in the mountains in and the community around it. My husband Charlie and I appreciate all the hard locational and survival work you went through, so we had the luxury of coming in to such a lovely location. Indeed, my first impression was that this place felt comfortable, homey, and welcoming, as if it had been here a long time. That too was the result of hours and hours of many hands and hearts at work. I offer this haiku as my thanks. The sun-kissed walkways exude the heartfelt blessing that permeates all. Thank you for being here. Let us enjoy this space and how we shape it. All right. If I could please have my wild cards join me up here while they are making their way. Come on, wild cards. Um, I will tell you my quick wild card story as an example. We're going to keep our stories relatively short because we've had a lot of talking in the service today. Um, so for me, hi. I came to MVUU shortly after my mother died. And those of you who are here probably remember me as that kind of sobby, polite, quiet girl over there in the corner who then became a very loud and outspoken girl <laughs> singing cabarets in Jane Paul's living room and being a part of the PA team pretty quickly. Um, the moment for me that I knew that this was my home, I was getting ready to sign the book in my new membership ceremony. And as Debbie opened the book magically to the exact page was my mother's signature when she had joined almost exactly four years prior. And it was, it was quite a moment. There were tears, there were hugs. But for me, that's the moment that I knew that I had found my way home. exact moment that's the difficult part 
Um, my background is that I've actually lived in Tucson for many, many years, and I have actually lived across from the Unitarian Church since 1990, smack dab across from Cromwell. And I used to go there to vote. So I knew of existence, but I had been raised Catholic, and very early on, I couldn't handle any of that. Um, and as an adult, had never participated in any uh, church at all. I would visit, but it was always seemed to be sort of the same formula. And uh, so I was getting older. I knew that I was going to be retiring. I knew that even though I'm pretty much an introvert, I really need people. So I bought, went over to the Unitarian Church one day and sat down for the service and thought, this is nothing like I've ever experienced before. I think Eb was playing the guitar and the sermon was nothing about what I was used to and the format was totally different. And it was, it was amazing. And I thought, this is really kind of cool. And I will be forever thankful to Jane. Jane, who wheeled me in. Yeah. <laughs> come on in, come join us. And that's exactly what I did. And it was only one visit that took it and um, took me to becoming a member of this congregation, though, as Tom Bunch knows, it took me a long time to sign the actual book. We were trying to set a record and, you know, I'll let him still be the bearer of that record. <laughs> but I think it took me five years. <laughs> I'm Dorothy Jacobs, and we moved here from Colorado Springs, where we retired from the heat and humidity of Houston. And in Houston, uh, we were UCC, which I've heard is Unitarians Considering Christ. <laughs> um, but when we moved to Colorado Springs, we tried to find a UCC church. And in Colorado fashion, the, uh, it was July, and the church was closed for vacation. And so we went around the corner, since we were all dressed up for Sunday, and found all Souls Unitarian Church, a very, very old church from like the 1800s. And we went in and it was really different, but yet very formal. And we found out that there was a branch where we were now living in the Northwest Park. And so we went there and um, we really liked the modern service and the minister, and so we joined. And then we moved here when we uh, couldn't stand the blizzards, icy snows, and um, we continued being Unitarians. I made it, I get to keep it. Thank you guys so much for doing the wild card experiment. If you enjoyed that, we're gonna do it again. <laughs> So now it's my job to tie this all together. What is the lesson that we take from all these testimonies and anecdotes and the words sung by the crier? Yes, we have been resilient, very resilient, and look where we are now. We meet in this beautiful building where there is room for all our activities. We are financially secure thanks to the hard work of our board and our flock has grown to the extent that we are right on the verge of becoming a program church. We would not have gotten here without the resilience of our founders and others who have played important roles in the life of this church. We do have a way of honoring our founders and others for their financial contributions. On the patio, we now have two beautiful plaques both created by Santa Teresa Tile Works. One honors those who contributed to the effort to buy our first home. And the founders of MVUU are among the names you will see on that plaque. The other plaque honors those who generously funded the purchase and renovation of this location. I urge you to take a closer look at them during coffee hour. Not only are they works of art, but they are an important reminder of how we got where we are today. Members and friends of this church have been seekers. 
seeking to keep this church alive. And they have also been keepers, keeping on, keeping on, and believing in our mission. Though I am not a founder, I am glad to have been part of this journey. I wonder where the next generation of seekers and keepers will lead us. We have one more song for us all to sing together. It is the hymn number 354. If you've got a gray hymnal, if you don't, the words will be on the screen regardless. We're committed to always having the words on the screen, but if you ever do want a hymnal, they're on the shelf just outside the door over there in the Oasis. I also wanted to say an enormous and huge thank you to Charlie for coming and playing percussion with us today and singing in the choir most of the time. And a huge thank you to all the wonderful people in the choir who, when uh, Debbie and I came in on Wednesday and said, we have an idea, they all went, oh, okay, that sounds like fun. And none of them went, what, at me. And I am extremely grateful for that. And I'm also grateful for Joel, who's gonna lead you in this song. It's number 354, we laugh, we cry, and please, let's rise. church about 10 minutes after we finish here there will be a meeting in the mesquite room for those of you who are joining or contemplating joining the church and we'll be talking about how mvu runs how it functions is that right tom is that close enough okay thank you so we are going to extinguish our chalice today with a piece that we adapted um, from someone named Harold E. Babcock. This piece is titled, And Now We May Go Forth. And now we may go forth in the certainty of faith, in the knowledge of love, in the vision of hope, and with the power of resilience. May we continue to be seekers and keepers and thrive resiliently. And in our going, may we be blessed with all good things on this day, and forevermore, amen. I want to play another chorus of blues. I need your help. And 
five. Friends don't let friends clap on one and three. So one, three. One, two, three, four. Don't speed up. A one, two, three. 